and because you have such a fascinating story background and new book that's come out and it's called yes. time to come off the porch a journey of healing from the wounds of kinship care in the black family and it's awesome i already uh, took the time to read it and i really enjoyed it and that's why i wanted to get to know dr kimberly a little bit better um since yes. we talked last you had uh, some ex a new exciting workshop that you um was it your first it was a pilot uh, workshop it was actually a pilot workshop and it was created about two years ago and when i was doing my dissertation i worked with my pastor uh, St. Peter's Missionary Baptist Church here in Atlanta, and I wanted to talk to the women and the children in the church who were in kinship care family relationships. Majority of the people that we spoke to were grandparents who were actually raising their grandchildren, and some of the grandparents had children that were uh, experiencing addiction. Some had been incarcerated. Some just walked away from parenthood. And the grandparents stepped in to raise the children. So we have a great deal of those parents, grandparents that are there uh, that are uh, present in the church. So we wanted to do something to address some of those issues. The workshop I had this week was with um, a group of women from House of Cherith um, that, are, that are housed in Atlanta, Georgia. These are women who have survived a um, great deal of trauma. Uh, the women we work with are Specifically, women we have that we have rescued from human trafficking, and a lot of them have histories of abuse. Um, great deal of them have children who are in foster care or in kinship care. And they are struggling with um, recovery, and they are now they are now in recovery, actually um, dealing with the years and years of addiction. But they are in recovery now. So part of the plan was to present this kinship care camp. And the idea of this is to offer inform informational type of um, group or, or um, a workshop for individuals who are, it was like a triad, individuals who are raised in kinship care, those who are the caregivers of these children, and then those who are the biological parents of the children in kinship care, and to bring them all under the same roof for um, information, for dialogue, for uh, collaboration, for support. So what we do, we come together every morning and we have videos that are based on some aspect of kinship care. The first day, which was Thursday, we talked about what is kinship care? Who are the uh, players in kinship care? Who are the family, uh, family types in kinship care? We talked about the needs of those individuals in kinship care. Friday, we talked about the caretakers in kinship care and what that looked like and what their specific needs would be. And from that conversation brought out so many tears, so much, oh, wow, unresolved trauma that some of the mothers had not thought about because they didn't think about the fact that my children are not with me, but they're with caretakers who are providing care for them. So we were able to show a couple of videos on what that looks like as far as from the care, caretaker's perspective on the support they need from the biological parent, the support they need from the system. Some, some uh, states now have navigator systems where you can tap in and receive services and uh, linkages to services. And also we talked to the perspective of the child, what that may look like. So come next week, we're going to conclude our conversation. So we have two more days and we meet from nine to three. And um, so there'll be four days in total that we'll, be meet, we'll, we'll come together. So the goal is to have a day of in, in, in introduction, a day of uh, talking about caregivers, one talking about biological parents, and then bringing in the youth, their voices and saying, hey, what about me? Mm -hmm. And the needs I, I had in kinship care, the needs that were provided, those that were not, and I need you to hear my voice kind of thing. And then we have the rest of the afternoon, we're going to talk about healing. How do all three of these um, groups come together and begin talking about healing, what does that look like for me? How do I find my voice? How do I how do I use my voice to let you know what my needs are so we can come together as a family system to make this work? Sounds like, although there's a lot of pain and trauma, I've heard that those mm -hmm. words used, mm -hmm. um, there sounds like there sounds like there's some pride 
in the the 21 was it 21 people you said at 21 yes yes it sounds like there's a lot of pride um that you speak with um about them and about yourself do you did you sense that did do you think that the people that participated in this uh, workshop felt some empowerment knowing that they were taking care of their own kin and mm -hmm. although they probably felt I'm putting words in people's mouths based on everything mm -hmm. I've heard up to now, but I know that a lot of us feel failed that there's not enough support services, but I'm speaking from mm -hmm. a different point of view. Do they feel any pride in the fact that they, even though that without support, they've done it themselves and mm -hmm. kept their kin together? Yeah, I heard a lot of that. I heard, I was, it was a little mixed though, because we had some ladies that were saying, wow, I still feel guilt and shame okay. for not being there for my kids. And then some women were like, you know what? I didn't recognize how important the role was for my mother and my dad or my cousin or my sister to step in and be there for my, uh, my, my children. And so that was dynamic. That was very helpful. Um, having them, having the conversation um, was very good for them. And they shared that because after the, each session, I wanted to make sure that each woman was heard and if they had any, um, soft spots or if something that had been opened, we can work with them as far as like giving some type of um, support and some closure to as we ended the sessions. Um, so a lot, very, they were very, um, they, they found, they, like, what, what I, what I heard was they were um, thankful because they had never had opportunity to come into a space and have this kind of conversation. Because of the, they didn't know that. I, I'm sure like, um, I've, you know, being in, you know, I've been on all sides of this, but, you know, like a grandparent may be not reaching out for help, maybe because their child is incarcerated. So they have those children and then they're ca carrying the burden of that child, carrying the burden of the, the children, but they may not feel comfortable asking for help or yes. knowing exactly what to ask for. Exactly. And that was some of the, uh, one, one, one of the ladies that was there, she talked about how she didn't know there were services to be asked for. She took in her little, I think a brother or sister, and she raised them for a couple of years. And she had surrendered the child to another family member because she couldn't do it because of the lack of services. So then not knowing that they exist and really not knowing how to tap into them in your state that's really is that's a that handicaps a lot of our ladies because if i don't know that this information is out there and some of the information we got from one of the videos we watch is that if you have um, blemishes in your past you may not be able to bring that child into your home because of the background checks so they were like you know that's some of the things i came up against and i didn't know how to overcome it i didn't have an advocate speaking for me Yes. Wait, and uh, um, there seems to be like I I've been on you know the side of being a foster youth, and then the, on mm -hmm. the side of being a foster parent, I got to make a years a year long decision on whether I was mm -hmm. going to be a foster parent. So I started taking the classes, started filling out the paperwork. Um, I was able to quit at any time. Um, mm -hmm. so if I, you know, mm -hmm. like we went through, you know, there was 10 steps, my husband and I kept saying, well, if this isn't right for us. We're going to quit. Kinship care is the complete opposite. You have sometimes 24 hours to make a decision. Mm -hmm. You get no training, you get no support. Um, and yes. sometimes you're penalized for just being, a, um, associated with what the, you know, what the bio family was doing. Um, mm -hmm. So do you think that if, you know, speaking from the perspective of the caregiver, do you feel that caregivers um, had anything that they would like to share with social workers or the court system um, if they could have a, a voice that was heard? Mm -hmm. One of the voices I heard was that, you know, was the, one of the one of the ladies, it was really hard because she was saying she has issues of literacy so she had no one she had the barriers that had been there but she really didn't have anybody to even to tell that you know i want my grandkids but i don't have i don't even know how to go about doing the documentation so it's about having someone who would speak 
who would spend the time with the, the, the caretaker and try to figure out the intricate things they specifically needed because the needs vary. You may have an affluent family that's a part of a, a kinship system and they can bring the child and not even need any financial assistance. But then you have some that may need specific things like I, I can't, I'm handicapped, I wanna get the kids to school, but I can't do it on my own. So how do I get wraparound services to have someone come in and help me with this? So I think that being able, if we have resources in place of maybe um, having advocates that would be able to go and make house calls, that may have it like a social, like social workers would do, go in the home and figure out what, what the need is. Instead, but at the same time, instead of looking for the problem, mm -hmm. look for the need mm -hmm. instead of looking for the problem. Yes, 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 okay. yes, exactly. Looking for the need because there are needs. And so the needs are that the problems are, of course, maybe I have other things going on, but right. if I'm here for this child and, and because you think I'm close to the family member and you're um, not holding me in regard that I need to be held in to be there for that child, mm -hmm. then that's a, um, then that's a, that's a, it's difficult for the family right. to move on beyond that point. So having someone that may tune into that family and say, okay, what are the needs you have? There was one, we had an agency that we, or was a video we watched, it was called Lilliput, I'm not even sure what state it was in, but they were able to have someone that works specifically with the family and they had all kind of barriers in the way, but then they had someone to say, I would walk with you no matter what. No matter what the barriers were, I will go to court with you. I will walk with you to do the documentation. I hope you go to the doctor's appointments and things like that, just because to ensure the condition. Because you're yes. stepping up and you're doing what's right for that child. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so amazing. that was remarkable. And so the professionals, sometimes they are um, familiar with working with sometimes some educated foster parents who have been, you know, had time to think about it, had time for training, time to mm -hmm. um, process everything. And then you have right. a kinship that is maybe trying to work full time or living on disability and all of a sudden um, being penalized for not showing up to things that they've had no time or haven't been trained to, or even, it wasn't even on their, you know, they, it, it wasn't even radar on their mm -hmm. radar. So mm -hmm. um, those are some, maybe some things that maybe the court system needs to understand. And then maybe that we're, we're missing some awesome resources for children. And then the yeah. flip side, you said there, it was a generational workshop where you had mm -hmm. um, even the children there. Did you, you know, and also yourself being a former um, foster youth and um, being, you know, a, a raised in a kin kinship, do you um, have anything that you wish that would have been done differently and that the um, social workers and this court system would know from your point of view? From my point of view, I really wish there had been someone that would um, have provided consistent educational training or workshops for my parents. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't have access to resources. There was You're no- You're talking about financial. adaptive parents. My, my adoptive parents, yes. Not your bio. Now, my, my, my bio parent, um, well, actually, if they had some workshop for her as well, because she needs to understand the dynamics or the fallout from not being my caretaker. Um, her surrendering me into kinship care, giving me up into kinship care. Um, she walked away with a lot of stuff a lot of pain, unresolved pain. And that's a lot of what we saw in the workshop this last two days, because everyone's voice was in the room at the same time. And so the pain was, I'm a biological parent and no one and, and no one sees my needs. Mm -hmm. No one, and, I, and I, I applaud my sibling for stepping in and raising my child, but then I wanna, I, I do wanna have a relationship with my child. I do understand I wasn't fit at the time to be there. So if we had someone to even mm -hmm. say, okay, these are the specific issues that the biological parent has, let's help her along this process or him along this process mm -hmm. as they are engaging their child in care in, in the caregivership with that those individuals and be able to know where their their rights were, what their rights were, but also where boundaries needed to what be in boundaries? place. I boundaries. I, I think for many of the people that are going to watch this video, it's hard to understand 
without living it, the dynamic of a kinship and how complicated it is. I really mm. personally honor kinships um, for everything that we've already discussed because mm. as you move forward, you're, that caregiver who now maybe was originally with, had the title of aunt now is mom. Mm. And yes. now that hasn't changed the title of sister. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you've got mm -hmm. all this crazy stuff going on. It's such a, um, you know, you, you, you know, I can imagine for your parents watching you um, do everyday normal things and then feeling the joy and, and, and all of a sudden getting caught up in it and going, but do I have the right to feel this joy because I see my sister mm -hmm. um, suffering over here? Exactly. You know, so much. And the, the fact that they raised you and they did such an awesome job, if I must say so. Um, Thank you. Know, how many degrees do we have? We have three. <laughs> I have six degrees. Six de oh, sorry. Six degrees. Three. I, know. <laughs> um, I mean, it, I mean, gosh, um, if anything, they, because of their ability to hang in there, I'm sure there were behaviors, um, yes. things going on around them, expectations. They still stuck by your side and never gave up. And if anything, you know, mo that's what most kinships do they, against all odds. Mm -hmm. um, so I just think that there's such a, a beautiful um, story to be told in every kinship and in, in, in especially not receiving the resources they get. So that's exactly. amazing. Is there, um, from your parents' um, pers um, perspective, and I'm sure it's in the book, but was there anything that they would have voiced to, in today's, uh, if they were sitting next to you, that they wish would have been differently, differently handled? Wow. I, I think for them, they would have liked to have said or wanted to have said that they're not trying to take the place of the bio parent. They're just trying to give me the foundation that they believe I needed to have to become the woman they wanted me to be. Oh. It was not taking her place, mm -hmm. but substituting and making so substituting that the things that I needed and that it, it was no it was no reason to be mm -hmm. um, resentful of them um, because they always included they didn't even do a legal adoption of me because they never wanted to take her parental rights away. But at the same time, I believe there um, there was some ebbs and flows in that because like you mentioned a minute ago, they were proud of me. They raised me, they celebrated with me. Then when it was time for my bio parent to come around to be a part of those celebrations, you always felt this um, unspoken friction that was there. We gave my dad a um, 65th birthday celebration and it was beautiful. I spoke as the daughter one of the daughters and had a friend that was present and she witnessed all of that. And she said, oh my God, the look on your mother's face, my biological mother's face, they broke her heart because she, she knew I was speaking to my dad and my mom and thanking them for the love. But at the same time, she, in that moment, it shifted from that's, that's my brother-in-law and I'm proud of him, happy birthday, to he raised my daughter and she loves him as a dad and that's, and that's her mom. So it makes it real for her every time She's in those spaces, even though we're not trying to stomp on her heart or hurt her feelings, the reality comes up every time we come together. Mm -hmm. So there's always this unspoken friction that's there. So if we can speak to that or heal from that or help other families understand that, that you have a right as a caregiver, I want you to know, to be present for those kids and to celebrate them and, 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 ha and, and help them with their hopes and dreams and accomplishing those things. Be that for them. Don't feel you can't give that to them because they need that very much. Mm -hmm. um, so even if mom comes around or dad comes around and they're envious of that dynamic or that relationship you have with that kid, that's going to have to be okay. Because if not, then that child is the one that gets discarded. That child is the one that doesn't get their needs met. And then they are stumbling through life because no one stood up to help. No one stood up to be um, in that space for me. So even though it can be bio mom or dad, caregivers need to understand they have, they should feel privileged and feel okay. And, and they have the authority to step in to be that for those children. I, the thing that, you know, cause I did read your book. I think I had mentioned to you that um, the, the thing that struck a chord with me and still can bring a tear to my eye 
I Mm -hmm. I can understand things from your mom's perspective because I was a um, teenage mom and I was faced Mm -hmm. with some um, decisions myself. And like I said, I, um, you know, that's a big one. Every woman has to, has that cross to bear, Um, but she still shows up. Yes. And for that, I, I, I have so much respect for her and I would, you know, I, I look at this beautiful woman in front of me and mm-hmm. I think what a um, gift um, she gave the world. And, you. you know, the fact that she was in, a, in the mindset to, you know, step aside despite her pain to give you that, mm-hmm. you know, yes. Yes. I don't know if all of us have that in us. And I, I know I may not be one of them, but I just love your story so much. And I'm so grateful that you're sharing this. And I, I, I know that we said we we're going to keep this to, I don't know how long this uh, mm-hmm. little snippet was, but it's just perfect. And I, um, I hope you'll come back and do another one with us. Um, definitely. You definitely will. Good. I'm glad because mm-hmm. I, I have a feeling that people are going to learn so much from you and your story. Um, and they obviously mm-hmm. already are. And um, I think you were telling me, don't you have something coming up in addition to, like you have this other work that you do um, you have like a another workshop coming up or something yes actually i have another one working with um women who are it's a program called eaton village and it's a wonderful program that is there it's here in southwest atlanta we work with women who are who have recently who've been recently homeless and they're in care and they're receiving assistance and direction and case management and support for the whole entire family. So I'm going to work with those ladies as well to talk about what this looks like for them. And they all have different stories, I'm sure, and all different perspectives of what kinship care is and what that looks like for them and to give them a, a time to find their voice and also find the verbiage because the ladies I talked to last week and we'll finish our workshop this coming week, they never heard the term kinship care. But after talking about it and discussing it, they realized, wow, this has been a part of my life, yeah. my family for years, and I didn't have the words for it. So when I, I believe teaching the words and giving them the term, terminology gives them a way of then figuring out, okay, I, this is a situation I've been in. These are some of the, the characteristics of the situation. And wow, then these are some resources I can use too, because now I have the, the um, foundation to speak from. And then I now now know that I'm not by myself and I'm not alone in this. One of the women and it broke our heart because she was like, you know what? Until today, as my as a mother giving out to my sister to raise, I thought something was wrong with me. Mm-hmm. And now I realize I'm okay. Mm-hmm. That other people have had made these same decisions, and it's okay. It's okay when we need help. And so that was a beautiful thing that we heard in the room. And that was some of the sentiment I heard throughout the day. Mm 